Hi there, and welcome to Even in Our Backyard, our broken democracy in Massachusetts. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, I think the, we are really gonna have a very engaging conversation about what is happening in Massachusetts state government. Uh, and I hope that people come away from here uh, understanding more about how Massachusetts state government works than maybe you ever wanted to know. So I really appreciate everyone being here and all of those as well who are on uh, watching live and maybe watching after the fact. So um, I'm Anna Callahan from Incorruptible Mass and I am here with former state rep uh, Kathleen Tian and you go by Kathy, is that right? Yes. Wonder, wonderful by Kathy, um, who was a state rep for 10 years. And I'm also here with Jack Stanton, who is a candidate for state rep um, right now, someone you could vote for. Uh, and we are going to be talking about uh, our broken democracy here in Massachusetts. There's a lot of talk, of course, about our democracy in decline nationally, that we really have some very serious problems uh, with our national democracy, a crisis of um, you know people not believing that we have one, people voting for you know people that just do not have any um, do, do not uphold democratic values like small d democratic values, um, and yet a lot of people think that in Massachusetts we're doing, <laughs> and yet. Um, I think you will hear tonight that there are deep problems here as well. So first, I just want to go ahead and have, um, that's kind of why I'm here to talk about those problems. And I would love to have Kathy talk for a minute about just why you're here tonight and what you want to talk about. Thank you, Anna. And I'm here basically still working on political issues because of my grandchildren and everybody's grandchildren. I just turned 75 a couple of weeks ago, and I am with a group of people my age who said, why don't you slow down and take a break? And it's because it's important for all of us to do what we can. It might not be anything big and earth shattering, like when you're interested rock, which is an incredible job, but um, just paying attention, getting out and voting. And because I saw things that bothered me when I was in the legislature from 1997 to, to 2007, it bothered me even worse as time went on. And especially in 2016, when we saw that people had given up so much hope that they would vote for a person that I would have been a better person. This is my lack of background and the um, damage that's been done throughout the years, not just then, but I think people felt as if nobody was paying attention to them. They heard all these wonderful words about the way we were taken care of, and it just didn't happen. And people were looking for a savior. And unfortunately, the one that was presented to them through Fox News and all the for profit news agencies like that um, was the true savior. Yeah. Thank you. And Jack, um, I would love to hear why, you know, what you want to talk about tonight and why we're here at a at an event called Even in My Backyard, Our Broken Democracy in Massachusetts. Absolutely. Uh, so Jack Stanton, uh, lifelong Cape Cotter, uh, resident out here in Provincetown, uh, service worker, fisherman, and candidate for state rep here in the fourth part school district. Um, we're in the middle of a heat wave right now. We're lucky to be air conditioned, but for folks who are joining us remotely, wherever you are, um, the Northeast is getting whacked right now. Um, our planet is is quite literally on on fire. And um, for me, the biggest issue that on my mind on my mind, which got me into electoral politics, was the climate crisis, and uh, sort of an action that I have seen over the course of my lifetime uh, within a lot of our democratic institutions. Um, and uh, here in a state like Massachusetts, um, I think that we always pride ourselves as being a model, uh, you know, a 
first in so many things from you know marriage equality to the abolitionist movement. Um, but when you actually look at what our legislature actually delivers compared to what's in our party platform, there is a serious disconnect between policies that are popular and would make a difference in people's lives and what actually comes out of uh, a session of legislature, which is usually uh, putting thing, everything putting everything off the last minute in July at the end of the session, rushing to pass consolidated amendments and sending a lot of the really popular uh, pieces of legislation that would make material changes in people's lives to study, to wait for another session to go by. And I think that uh, it's important to um, speak in an aspirational way about you know, our political system, about what we can do. Um, and I think that folks, um, if they paid a little bit more attention to state politics, they would be really dismayed to see uh, what, what goes on uh, in our name, in the public's name. Uh, so I'm excited to talk about some of these, these issues tonight uh, and super fortunate to be uh, joined by Mr. Lee here who has been doing such good work um, on these issues. So. Yeah, people might be dismayed and hopefully galvanized, right? People might realize that there's so much work to do here and we really can make strides, we can. Um, so uh, Kathy, you have written a book and I'm so excited for you to talk. I read, read it and um, really have just some amazing takeaways from it. Um, and I wanna just give you a little bit more of a deeper introduction so people know more about you and then have you talk about your book. So um, Kathleen Tian served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives from 1997 until 2007. And throughout her years in the legislature, she worked for justice and quality health care for all, focusing on oral health, quality education, equal rights, and the environment. When Tian moved to Harwich Court in 2008, she started writing a memoir about her 10 years in the Massachusetts legislature. Concerned by the troubling political division and the systemic racism in the U.S., Kathy finished her memoir. For the People Against the Tide, that's the name, I love it, in September of 2021. She believes that if we all do something, no matter how small, we can bring our government closer to the dream of democracy with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness equally available to all. Her goal is to leave a better world for her grandchildren and for children throughout the world. And Kathy, can you, I want you to feel free to really kind of go on for a bit about what is in your book? Because there's so much that you learned from being a state representative for 10 years. Thank you. Well, day one in 1997, I was sworn in, very excited to be there. My husband had talked me into it because he said, you'd like to help people. You've been involved in that was Scholarship Foundation, School Committee, Parish Council, um, Reverse Minister. Have that, you know, you make them. I wanted to help people, that's why I ran. So, as soon as you sworn in, the next activity is to vote for the Speaker of the House. And the Speaker has campaigned previously about you know, getting votes for him. And usually they have a total vote of the Democratic caucus, which did happen. And there's, um, no abstentions or you know, contradictions to them being voted except once in a while. But that person from day one is then on the outs from the speaker who controls where your office is, what committees you're on, um, where you park, what bills of yours pass, what um, gets into the budget for your district, so many things. And um, so that happens in every year after you vote on the speaker, you vote on the rules for the house and the speaker has been adding more rules to give the speaker more power almost every year. And um, when the speaker can give out a chairmanship, which is um, 15 to 30 to sometimes $45,000 more than the $70,000 that is the initial um, salary of state rep. People don't want to lose those. And so um, everybody, after they voted for the rules, which we do because if we don't vote for the rules, it's showing a lack of confidence in speaking. 
there's some, some, it has this incredible power. And um, when I was elected, I thought, and my husband told me, you like to help people. Being in politics, you really be able to help people. Well, I could do a lot through constituent service and working on items such as the oral health for children at the time and oral health for adults. But um, I saw so many things go by the wayside that really would have made a difference in the quality of life for everybody. So um, it was quite a surprise and disappointment to me to see the way it actually ran. And sometimes when I would be upset about what was actually happening, some of the reps would say, don't worry about it, it's only a movie. This is not only a movie, this is affecting people's lives. This is supposed to be a democracy. And um, so one of the first things that I told them, you about that I worked on was the oral health for children. And I had an amendment in my second budget and it was to include the insurance payments for children's dental care and um, in the mass health and in the chip program. So I had gone around to the 160 reps and I had over 90 people sign on to my amendment. And when it was about midnight the night we were debating this $24 billion budget, it was in that time, my amendment came up and I asked to be recognized by the speaker. And when I did that, he gabbled the session to be in recess and he called me up to the roster. And he said, oh, our ways and means committee doesn't think that this is a good amendment and we're not going to be passing that. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> Do they work with people at all the background information about the impact of this on children's health and on their future lives with their kids? And um, so he told me to talk to the ways and means that did that still didn't change my mind. Then the speaker called up the chair of the health care committee that I was on, and I really respected her, and she told me that. I would be spotting my colleagues if I called for this vote because people sign on to bills and then if their constituents think they're going to vote for them, but the speaker doesn't have that in his plan and agenda and the speaker votes red, they have to choose whether they vote green with you and your amendment or red with the speaker and only do so many red Votes before the other changes have been know that you're not going to be getting what you need that. So that was my initial shock of um, what was going on. And, and later on, there were other things that happened. But um, to know that we had that power, we had the money, and we could have done so much more. And I loved every single day that I was in the legislature because it's a place where you meet incredible people, you learn so much. And um, the reason that I left after 10 years was because the more you helped people, the more people called on you for help and the work just piled up on the office floor. And my one aide and I, which was all I ever had in my 10 years, couldn't keep up with the work. While at the same time, there were people who were in other positions that really didn't have to do any extra work, but they received a championship salary in second aid and it just didn't make sense that you know a person who really wanted to help I also when I ran and just throughout life I was basically an introvert even though I was a teacher I didn't like the limelight I didn't like public speaking at all and um, but I found out in the legislature we need a lot more listeners than we do speakers who can get up and talk you into thinking that everything is fine and dandy and change the language to make it um, seem a lot better than it was. So, um, so I got it and I started my memoir when I moved to the Cape as a washer in 2008 and was taking a memoir class and everybody in the class was astonished at what I wrote every week and said, you know, you want to do more. 
of that. So I kept fighting, but then when I brought it to an agent, she said, people are really interested in memoirs these days, but that chapter you have on the Toll House chocolate chip cookie, which <laughs> was invented in my hometown of Whitman, would really be a great book. So I did write that book, and it was a lot of fun, and it's a happy story. Memoir had a lot of things that I'm not happy to read about, but there is happiness and hope at the end, and people start to get involved, and everyone can do something. And a lot of people my age say, it's been like this forever. You know, it's not going to change. Well, it's not going to change if we don't do something about it. And in spring of 2021, while I was working on just the final edits of my book and the um, book design, Jack Stanton came to our town meeting in college, and he was talking about all the things that need to be improved in the House of Representatives to bring the power back to individual representatives who are there because they were elected and they're being paid with amounts of money. And um, they, they don't have the power that they're given from their constituents. So Jack was talking about all those things. And the more I got to know him, the more he said, we need 160 tax <laughs> and there are bad people in the legislature, but it's a broken system and it's a vicious circle that if we don't do something, it's going to continue going and things are not going to be improved. Yeah. Absolutely true. Thank you for writing the book. It's amazing. I really recommend it to people. Uh, for the People Against the Tide, uh, check it out. Get it on Amazon, other places you can get a copy of it. Yes. Great. Um, so, uh, Jack, I want uh, for everyone here to hear a little bit more about you, um, why you're running for office, what your background is, um, what sort of brought you to this place, um, and, uh, and what you want to do when you get there, right? Um, so, Jack Stanton is a 30 year old Provincetown resident running for state representative to serve the working people of Cape Cod in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Uh, he is a service worker, a fisherman. Uh, I always like to say a lobsterman. <laughs> Just sounds so Massachusetts, you know. Um, and uh, progressive and a progressive, committed to fighting for the long-term health and future of our community. Jack has organized locally, and most recently was a volunteer with Act on Mass, who is, by the way, co-sponsoring this event. Thank you, Act on Mass. Um, and for Act on Mass's People's House campaign for greater legislative transparency as well as an active volunteer for Bernie Sanders uh, 2020 presidential campaign. He is running to give workers a greater voice in the halls of power, as well as to fight for the progressive values that this community holds dear at a moment of unprecedented urgency. Jack, tell us a bit more about you and about why you're running and what you'll do when you get there. Sure. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Kathy, for, for talking about your time in the legislature. Um, so, I kind of got to electoral politics about four years ago um, when I first moved back home to the Cape. So I grew up here on Cape Cod, I moved here when I was six years old um, in the town of Sandwich. Um, so technically uh, I'm a wash ashore, uh, but I've spent the majority of my life uh, here, here on the sandbar. Um, grew up in a union family in a small town and had a really, I think, privileged upbringing um, and an idyllic childhood. And, you know, growing up in a community where uh, people looked after each other. And uh, there was this sense that, uh, you know, neighbor, neighbors would take care of other neighbors. And that was the sort of uh, childhood that I grew up with that informed a lot of my values, and a lot of my politics. Um, I went on to, to school down in DC, studying international affairs and very much wanted to have uh, an international career, which would take me away from the shores of Cape Cod, just because it was a big, big world out there. And, you know, for the early part of my 20s, I uh, most of my academic career, I was working pretty much exclusively in international settings. So um, uh, I graduated in 2014. I, I worked uh, at the World Bank, uh, which, uh, you know, was in the office of the vice president, uh, eventually worked under uh, the managing director, um, and uh, eventually got a posting overseas in Southern Africa, where I was doing um, monitoring and evaluation work for uh, research consultancy in Mozambique. Um, enjoyed the path that I was on. I had a dream career. 
Um, I was living an expat life, um, you know, doing work that uh, was informing a lot of like the, the aid programming that was going on uh, uh, overseas. Um, but when you spend out time outside the country and look at what's going on from the outside, um, it changes your perspective on things. And um, as someone who was, you know, very much uh, enthralled with uh, the Sanders movement in 2016, uh, uh, seeing someone who, you know, was honest and, and, and forthright and, you know, had you know, deliberate values and policies that were going to make a difference in people's lives really, really excited me as a young person, uh, spoke to uh, an aspirational future that, you know, I hadn't seen the Democratic Party in my lifetime uh, actively put their money where their mouth was and trying to deliver those policies. Um, and then seeing someone like Donald Trump getting elected was like a, a punch to the gut. Um, I was one of two Americans in, in my office. And I remember very vividly the day after the election, um, people were whispering around the office saying, what, what's up with Jack? What's up? He hasn't said anything all day. And I'm a very outgoing social person and was very chatty around the office. So, you know, people with clearly said the problems that, oh, yesterday was, was the US election. So um, I lived with that for, for about a year. And uh, in late 2017, I made the decision to, to move back home to Kip Cod and, and get um, involved politically at the local level where I thought, you know, I'd be able to, to make a difference. Um, a lot of the work that I was doing overseas was, you know, tied to climate in some way. Uh, a lot of the programming that we were working on was uh, in response to climate-induced drought, uh, which uh, uh, has been an enormous problem in Southern Africa. Um, and then understanding, you know, the climate impacts that my home community was going to be facing. Um, you know, it made me want to do something about it because over the course of my entire life, I've heard people talk about global warming and climate change as, as a problem and, you know, never saw, you know, concrete actions being taken to the scale of what scientists say. So I moved home in 2018. Uh, I ran for, for state rep against uh, uh, a sitting Republican in my home community. Um, came up short, but learned a lot in the process and, and really enjoyed that uh, action of getting out into the community, knocking on doors and talking to people. Um, remained uh, involved uh, as time went on. I was a uh, volunteer with the Sanders campaign. I was a volunteer with Act on Mass. Um, I've helped with various uh, small political efforts locally. Um, and during the pandemic, I ended up moving out here to, to Provincetown. It was a weird time for, I think, everybody. And, um, uh, my best friend, uh, who's in the audience tonight, uh, uh, and I surfed quite a bit together over the course of, of that period of time. And I was driving out to uh, Wellfleet from Truro, uh, the Outer Cape, with increasing frequency. Um, I was also uh, fixing up my uh, sailboat that spring. Um, and uh, one thing led to another where I ended up getting a job out here in Provincetown. And, uh, moving on board my boat and kind of making this place home. Um, in my time uh, volunteering with Act on Mass, that's how I got to, to meet Kathy uh, and get to talk about here in Massachusetts, some of the, the systemic problems that, that we're facing. Um, and the, the one issue that, you know, I got to find out more about since I started getting involved electorally um, has been just the utter lack of transparency which exists within our state legislature. Um, earlier, you know, I talked about you know the enormous veto-proof supermajorities we have and this you know, bold uh, agenda that we have at our party platform. And yet, session after session, we don't deliver on these things. Well, there's there's a reason for it, and a lot of that has to do with um, the rules that the, the legislators set for themselves, and the sort of culture within the building which. Um, really reduces the agency of rank and file members to be able to do their jobs, which is to uh, advocate for the communities that they come from, the issues that are impacting their communities, and for uh, an agenda that's going to seek for the, the policies that are going to pursue the public good here, here in Massachusetts. And so uh, in a state house where you have the Speaker of the House that has all the power, uh, reps that don't even have time to be able to read what they're going to vote on, um, 
committee votes being taken in secret where, you know, a popular piece of legislation just go to die and then try and find out why that happened. You can't. I mean, these are, this is why our democracy is, is broken. And so um, I think it's an important to be working with uh, individuals and organizations who are going to talk about a lot of these problems because um, I think it's just an education issue. Most folks aren't aware of, of how broken our system is in Massachusetts, number one, and B, aren't aware of what we could have in Massachusetts only if people paid attention and, uh, you know, expected their, their elected officials to uh, conduct themselves in a certain way, which is why I'm thrilled to be here uh, tonight with, with Kathy, who is uh, uh, someone who has the lived experience as someone who served in the legislature and, uh, you know, dealt with a lot of these cultural problems within the institution is in speaking out about changes. And uh, with Anna, who is a former candidate herself and in charge of an organization, uh, running candidates like myself, I'm not alone, I'm not the only one running uh, on this uh, 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 platform of trying to get progressive issues and rules reform at the top of the agenda this cycle. And um, I just think that, you know, if I'm able to get to the state house, um, I would use that public platform of being an elected official um, to be able to a, speak to the, the, the issues that aren't getting addressed enough from uh, the housing crisis to the climate crisis uh, to the, the lack of transparency with our democracy, which is preventing anything meaningful uh, uh, from getting passed uh, out of our state legislation. Ooh, so this is what we're here to talk about. Um, wonderful to hear about your background. I actually didn't know all that international work that you did. That's amazing. Um, so, uh, you know, I wanted to go back. I have some quotes Kathy, from your book, and I, I would love for each of you to kind of talk a little bit about these. And you wonderfully mentioned every quote <laughs> that I'm going to quote here. So they will all sound familiar. Um, before I do that, I always like to just rephrase transparency a bit because sometimes that word sounds a little vague. So in Massachusetts, there is no way for you, for me, for any of us to know how our state reps vote on bills because they have voted to make all their votes by default secret. Now, we do, mm, right? Some people are like, you know, it's like, mm. <laughs> So that is what we mean when we talk about transparency, right? Um, and yes, do we get a couple dozen votes each, you know, a dozen or two dozen votes each session? We do. And often those are the more unanimous votes where there isn't a lot of dissent. Um, but the ones that are controversial, either they never come up or the vote never happens or it's in committee with their, you know, this basically is the vote or the, you know, we don't know the voting. So that's the transparency piece that we're talking about. And it is, by the way, incredibly unusual, the vast, vast majority of states in America, the state legislature is under public records law. So they can't, like, there, there is no option to not let people know how you vote. Like that's just the law. So this whole rules reform thing is about, you know, the fact that we don't, you know, we're unlike almost every other state, whole country. Um, it, we, we allow our legislature to vote, to keep all their votes secret. <laughs> kind of crazy. Um, so to your book and to the, some of the things that you talk about, and I want to highlight a little bit. Um, so this first quote, and I'm going to read a little bit of it. Um, so uh, a vote against the rules. And you were saying that the very first thing that happens is you are sworn in as a state rep. And then um, you have to vote for the speaker. Uh, and usually there's kind of only one choice, right? Um, and then you have to vote for the rules, which often include none of our votes will ever be seen by anyone, right? <laughs> um, amongst other things, amongst, you also mentioned giving the speaker more and more and more power. These are the rules that you voted on first. The very first thing you ever vote on as a state rep is the rules. And here's what you said in your book. A vote against the rules is viewed as a lack of confidence in the speaker. And as a result, you begin the year on the wrong side of the speaker. Representatives want to be viewed favorably by the speaker because the speaker has tight control over the House of Representatives. He decides upcoming committee assignments and pretty much what gets into the budget, what bills come before the House for a vote, and which bills pass. 
the speaker also determines the number of aides each rep has to assist with committee work, the annual budget process, district needs, constituent services, parking spaces, office locations. Um, the choicest offices overlook Boston Common, the least desirable spaces have no windows and very little work area. So um, talk for us for a little bit about that what effect does that have on people that the very first vote you do is one that sort of determines whether the speaker is going to give you a bunch of stuff or not? Well, when you go in as a new rep, you really don't understand that that's going to happen so much. And the book is quite thick. It's small in um, length and width, but the depth is very thick, small print, and you are so busy with other things happening that you don't even always get a chance. I had one friend who was a rep from the South Shore who really got into reading the rules and learning the rules and we could ask him anything about it, but um, most people don't have a lot of time to go over. So, so it's pretty, um, pretty sad and plus, when you're new, you don't even think, oh, these are rules. Like when I served on the school committee, we have rules like Robert's rules of order, the way we run ourselves. And you just assume that that's the way it's going to be. And um, I remember on the school committee that every issue we had, we discussed in open meeting with a camera in front of us. And we talked it out and we came to votes on them. And in the committees that I served on, like state administration and public health, when well, we had hearings and people would come in from all over the place and people would really um, express what was in their hearts and in their lives for people with ALS, people who um, had Lyme disease and were suffering horribly people with you know, all kinds of things. And so you listen for hours and hours to what they're talking about, but um, some reps don't even show up because they really don't care that much. So there aren't all these people sit on the whole media. But um, then the committee chairperson and if there's an assistant chair work to with the speaker to see which bills are actually going to be passed on to the next step, which will be another committee that looks at it. it, might be Ways and Means, or it might be Committee on Rules, or Committee on Bills, the uh, second reading, third reading. And at that time, while they're looking at things, as an individual rep, you can talk to them privately about what rules you want or don't want. But when we actually come to vote in the hearing room, you get a sheet of paper which has each bill, but the um, committee chair reads how it's going to be passed or failed. So we don't discuss it in an open meeting at all for people to hear. And um, it's decided ahead of time. And you can speak up and say, I dissent on this. But other than that, nobody knows what you voted on. And um, it's so many things are bundled together too when it comes to the big bills. Like the, recently, the bill that was um, passed, which I was looking at because it's so important to our families and our economy, is the um, early childhood care and education bill. And they passed it in large bill, but they tied it to the monies that would come in from the new lottery's ability to do online betting on other um, things. So there's no definite money source. It all depends on how much money comes in from that betting. And who knows how it's you know, turned down to the winnings and the lottery system is paying and stuff. So, so it's just not enough clarity on those things and openness. And, and people can tell the constituents that they're supporting that. 
in my work for it, but it actually went to study, which most girls go to studies. And they can be real studies, but the majority go to studies in women's work. So they're not good, they're not the way school committees work in our districts. And just to put a point on it, having to make this decision on am I gonna please the speaker or am I gonna make the speaker mad at me? The very first vote. How quick do you think that affects state reps like ability to, to sort of you know make their own decisions? That's pretty scary because you're there needing to help the district get as much funding as it can. Some things are like formula like the education and uh, um, highway, but there's all these other things that come up like um, emergency kinds of problems with the weather or um, the storms that have happened in you know, those kinds of things. You also have hospitals or other needs depending on your district and how much attention that you will get for that funding and for bills like local um, local bills that you want to change the charges in the town and how fast those things can happen all do depend on you being in the speaker's favor. So we really um, do want to be in the speaker's favor. And I really want to get to Jack, but I have one, just one other little question for you. Um, is the speaker going to help us pass transformative legislation? Is the speaker there to make sure that we pass transformative legislation that helps the 7 million residents of Massachusetts? Unfortunately, not. Um, the speakers have incredible amount of power and they are the ones that the lobbyists visit much more than the ordinary rank and file um, representatives that they, they um, the big money lobbyists are talk to the speaker and um, you can't help but vote for people who are giving you money for your campaigns and who are also going to be able to help you in other ways. Um, so the speaker also is looking towards his future. We've had speakers move on to presidencies of like UMass Amherst and other universities and they might be helping out those groups and I know reps who have um, helped other groups and then done a good job as executives of different companies because of their votes. And um, I just believe that we have to get enough representatives who will vote to give the speaker um, term limits and also the ability to have the strength to do things in the open the way it's supposed to be. I and mean, that's what I expected it to be, and that's what most people expected it to be. It's a sad see the situation, and it's gotten worse as the years have gone up on since I was there, but it can change. Jack, okay, so you come in, you're elected, congratulations. <laughs> and um, you're sworn in, and you have this choice. You have this choice of voting in favor of the rules that the speaker wants, which give the speaker a lot of power and don't allow the people of Massachusetts to know what happens. How do you navigate that choice between the favor of the speaker and the things that you have talked about wanting to do? And I'm, by the way, gonna hop up, make sure that my kid has enough to eat while okay, you talk. Sure. Um... It's, as you said, the most important vote one, one takes, and I think sets the tone. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, you have to, as someone who's running for office, know, know why you're doing it. Um, and so you're representing in a state, for a state, for a state of Massachusetts, somewhere between 42 and 45,000 people. Um, a lot of those people are um, in situations that are difficult, situations that are in positions of pain, discomfort. Um, and so while that's, I guess, a difficult vote to take, um, 
challenging the institution and the way things go, I think you have to remember why you're there. And it's to advocate for all of those people, many of which are, you know, in positions of discomfort um, and an urgency. And you're there for them. And um, at the end of the day, uh, these public platforms uh, uh, have agency to them. And if you don't have reps who are going to stand up to the system and use that public platform to speak out to the public about how dysfunctional the system is and why it's not delivering, we're never going to see any changes. And so, um, you know, and I, and I think as someone who's run before, and, you know, is, is taking another crack at it, um, I know why I'm running. Um, and so while it is, yeah, sure, going to be difficult, um, I know it needs to change. And, you know, to be one of those people who are going to raise those concerns and uh, vote uh, an emphatic no on uh, uh, rules that are going to shroud the legislative process in secrecy. Because a legislative process where uh, the public can't uh, follow up on what's going on is not a legislative process whatsoever. That's a share. And another follow up question to that. When you're elected, will you be alone or will you have a team of people to work with? on making sure that you have a plan of how to navigate all this stuff. Well, funny you should say that, Anna. <laughs> um, <laughs> as, as a uh, member of the slate of candidates endorsed by Incorruptible Massachusetts, uh, we know that this is a problem within the institution itself. And we have a whole slate of candidates who are, A, going to be fighting for uh, the progressive agenda that's in our party platform that we would like to enact here in Massachusetts, but also recognizes the uh, challenges within the institution itself, which are preventing us from delivering on these things. And we're going to have solidarity amongst each other, uh, you know, as we, you know, hopefully are all uh, elected and, and, and sworn in and uh, we'll be more of a uh, grassroots uh, based uh, derivation of power, not from one dude at the top of the heap who uh, is calling the shots like a mob boss. That's not how uh, a democracy is, is, is supposed to function. Um, so, you know, the, the Massachusetts House of Representatives, the, the People's House, um, it was the first, uh, when they put the first state house building in, it was one of the first public viewing galleries in, in the country where re regular members of the public could come in and, and see what their, their elected officials were doing on their behalf. Um, that's, you know, in our history of the Commonwealth. And I think we need to get back to that. You know, uh, as Kathy was saying, the fact that you have more scrutiny under involvement of a school committee or a planning board than you do in our state legislature, which has a $45 billion a year budget, is paid for, people are paid full time, I mean, salaries full time to, to represent their communities. It's inexcusable, you know, the higher up you go, it shouldn't be the less accountable that you are. You should be more accountable if you're having uh, uh, holding a position of, of such great public importance. So. Great. Um, all right. One more, another quote from the book, um, and you mentioned this earlier as well. So, uh, in your entire time there, you only ever had one staff member. Is that right? You were there for ten years. So, in your book, you say, um, you know, I reached a point when I could no longer keep up with the important requests um, coming from my constituents, even though my aide and I worked hard at it daily. An additional aide would really have helped. The speaker had given additional aides in return for loyalty. I guess I wasn't among the loyal ranks. So um, I, I think people don't understand really what constituent services is. Um, and can you talk a little bit about how sort of what you talk about is your, your whole motivation for going there is really helping people, um, but how, having an aid or multiple aids, what are those services and how that can really help you accomplish those? Well, people call you because of housing needs. Um, elderly people may be trying to get into the public housing in your town. Um, people might be looking to get their teacher's license that they've already passed the test for, but somehow got lost in the pile at the office, um, all kinds of things. People who have cancer and are looking to get their disability checks, all of those same treatments. And as a representative, you do have 
wonderful connections in every agency. You have a legislative liaison who will look things up for you, who will look through the piles of paperwork and see what they can find for people who need licenses, get that information. So we can do a lot for individuals. People don't know that you can do that. So my aide and I kept a log every day of all the phone calls, and then we had the constituent service forms where people's information, their requests, what we called, or who we called, and what could be done. And we kept that. And when I retired, we threw away, I think, three of those huge um, recyclable recycled papers because it was people's private information into those huge bins because um, that's what we had done year after year. So you are able to help those people and um, it takes a lot of time and energy, but that's what helps the law. And that's also what helped me get elected because even though I wasn't always getting some Big bills passed. I was taking care of my people. So, so that was good. And um, one of the other things I had to mention that the um, speaker gets to control is earmarks that are in large bills and earmarks that are in the million dollar budgets. And those kinds of things go to um, people who have really been good to the speaker and been very loyal. and that takes away from what the experts and the people who know who are working in the departments would use the money for for the real needs of the people because they're working on it day in and day out. And things um, like the ALS and the Parkinson's and the cancer, the, the studies that are done, but nothing ever gets done with them because they're not given the funding to finally go through and prevent these things from happening. And that's what our state and country could be doing so much better at, is preventing instead of spending the money to try to help people afterwards. And that's another big way we could change things. It's by changing the whole earmark system. Hmm. I love that way that you, you sort of married together the constituent services, which is one large part of being a state rep, with the passage of statewide legislation that, that actually will solve the problem from the first place and make it not even a problem anymore. It's really wonderful yeah. thinking about that. Yeah, well, I don't know Jack thinks the same way. <laughs> Women on the whole think about preventing. They have spent all the time on the caring of everybody. They've worked out, they've seen it. And um, a lot of times the legislature likes to um, fix the problem afterwards by um, saying everybody has to get sprinklers in buildings. It not only helps the sprinkler companies, <laughs> but it sounds like a wonderful thing that's going to happen and um, to, to put out the fire instead of preventing it or having better foster care for children so that that young woman who was in the warehouse in Worcester that had a candle because she had no home and she was there with her boyfriend and the um, warehouse burned down with eight firemen and they still turned. And we were taking care of these children to begin with who didn't have the issues. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Jack, so um, the whole question of having staff, we were, you know, Kathy was just saying how it's, it's first of all, the, a huge way that you can help your constituents. It's also, um, helps you get reelected. I like how you added that in there because people know who you are and they know that you help them. Um, and, you know, if you're gonna not curry favor with the speaker, you will have only one staff. And do you have some thoughts about how to, you know, navigate that? So, I mean, uh, you know, this is something I do want to do full time. And so I 110% is gonna, you know, go into, you know, doing that job. But, you know, as a candidate running with Incorruptible, you know, we have a strategy for that because we know that candidates that who are fortunate enough to be elected on the slate uh, are 
probably going to be getting basement offices. It's a big party down there. Looking forward to it. And uh, uh, are going to, you know, have reduced staff, even if, with, um, you know, a couple of years of seniority on, on other folks. Um, and, you know, we've talked about, you know, through uh, Incorruptible about providing resources for our, our legislators who need, you know, help with their casework. With all the people who are going to be able to volunteer and be able to help with that and so they can help each other um, with each other's casework. Um, I think, Kathy, I know you had mentioned uh, you know, how that was why you left the legislature. You loved your job and what you were doing, but your caseload got to be so high that um, you decided not to run for re-election. And that's a, a damn shame. Um, if you're um, doing a good job and serving your community, um, you should have enough staff to, to you know, get through the casework that your district requires there should be no set amount of money on that. Um, and while we're talking about staff, um, you know, there's a, a unionization drive going on with a lot of legislative staff right now who are underpaid and overworked. Um, and uh, first of all, I fully support uh, these, these state house workers who are uh, trying to, to unionize. Um, it's funny, I was, I was uh, you know, waiting on somebody's table a couple of weeks ago and, uh, you know, we were talking about how you know, the state doesn't deliver things and you know how it tends to waste money on frivolous things and this guy starts to go on this tirade he's like yeah and all these state house workers they want a union now and i was just like well sir did you know what they make a year to live in boston and the amount of work that they do i said they do all the work that the reps do i said you know these are people that are making like forty two thousand dollars a year uh to live in boston uh and are working you know 60 to 80 hour weeks that's absurd. I said, all they're asking for is to be paid, you know, what they're worth, some basic measure of dignity. And I said, with a state with a $45 billion a year budget can at least ensure that all of our legislators have adequate amounts of staff to what their constituencies require and that they're paid fairly. Is that too much to ask? And goes, oh, no, never, never really thought of it that, that way. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. You, you changed my mind. Right on, brother. So. Um, <laughs> oh, and, and just, again, for a little bit of context, you know, most other states have a, a body that of lawyers that are paid by the state to basically read through, help the legislators read through the bills and understand what's going on in there. Because not every legislator is a lawyer, right? That's background. Um, and in my opinion, they shouldn't all be lawyers, right? Um, there are other things to be done as a legislator aside from read law, right? Law. Um, and so most states do have that. And in Massachusetts, that was ended. There wasn't there one, and then it was ended. Do you remember the history of that? I thought we do have. There are lawyers in the different committees mm -hmm. who will help you with information, but they don't read over the bills and write a synopsis of what's in it. For you to find them, you have to ask them specifically what you wanted. But we did uh, gather as a group of women with some of their aides who were lawyers, on the same lawyers, and all of the things. And that was helpful. Yeah. Um, but I, my understanding is that other states really do have these, um, like just groups of great paid lawyers uh, that are there available to help, um, help write legislation, help read through legislation. Um, and we don't have that in Massachusetts. Um, and other uh, places have more aids for legislators, you know, so it is quite unusual. Um, and on this question of how much we pay our, the staff there, which is extremely low, um, you know, almost $2 million a year is paid out in now at this point in the 93 um, stipends that are added to state rep salaries um paid basically by the speaker to the people that the speaker chooses <laughs> because of their loyalty to the speaker so our tax dollars like 1.9 1. million dollars a year goes not to the staff and not to getting more staff which is really needed but instead it goes toward this system of favoritism um from the speaker that, that allows him to control what bills can pass and what bills can't pass very unfortunate. Um, so I would love it. I don't know if anybody who is listening has been um, sending in questions or if people here have any questions that you want to ask of either uh, Kathy Tian, who was the state rep for 10 years, or of Jack Stanton, who is running for state rep and has all sorts of ideas about 
um, you know, what he wants to do in the legislature. But please do think those questions up as soon as you have one, raise your hand um, or put something in the in the chat if you're watching online. Um, we're going to advance a little bit. I'm going to have, oh, we have a question already. Excellent. From the audience. Wonderful. Um, should we run the microphone out or I can just repeat it probably? So I'm um, a water wastewater commissioner in my town in Harwich, and we have to abide by the open meeting law. And um, we also need to do the state um, uh, ethics file. The ethics, yes. And so when, when I was doing one of the ethics, not just the video, but an actual in person uh, video, a Zoom, um, I asked. The, the people running the program do the state does the state legislature also do the open meeting law? And they said, of course they do. They wrote it. So I, I, I guess it's I my question is how how is it possible for them to write that elected officials throughout the state and volunteers that serve you know appointed volunteers have to abide by this. It, it, there must be some rule that they're breaking of Wow, right. I should have totally handed you the mic. <laughs> I, will, I will do my best to No, no, don't be sorry at all. I, I'm sorry. I should have handed it to you. So a wastewater commissioner from Harwich is here asking a question um, saying that they were uh, you were filling out your you have to follow open meeting laws in that commission. And you also have to file ethics uh, forms, right? And so you were talking to the people as you were doing these ethics sort of Zoom calls with um, officials from the state and asking whether state legislators have to follow open meeting law. Um, and, and of course, with this discussion, you know, it, it doesn't jive at all, right? <laughs> so your question is, how, how can they, what, what rules are they breaking? What's going on? Um, don't legislators need to? Don't legislators need to follow those open meeting laws and file those ethics things? I don't know, like, how do you think of something? Yes, there are the ethics laws like about um, conflict of interest and voting on your personal you know, companies and finances, money, things like that. But you don't see a lot of people recusing themselves from things that I remember. Um, when I was there, there was a vote to um, prohibit smoking in public buildings, and the state house was exempt. <laughs> so people could still smoke at the state house. So, so I don't know. The backfilled rooms, right? <laughs> 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 I believe that person you spoke to was incorrect. State legislators do not have to follow open meeting, right? That's the whole. That's the whole thing that they're not under public records law. They're exempt from public records law. It's like the fact that if you are a public employee in Massachusetts, this is another very weird rule. You are not allowed to ask people to donate to your campaign if you want to run for office. So, like a Boston public school teacher cannot ask anyone to donate to their campaign for state rep. But of course, it is an exemption if you're an incumbent. <laughs> if you're publicly paid as a legislator, you can ask for as much money as you want to. So there are all sorts of exemptions that apply to the legislature that don't apply to anyone else because they get to write the rules. <laughs> nice, nice to have that gig, right? Nice gig if you can get it. <laughs> um, Jack, public records law. Like, what? What's your thoughts on this whole thing? It's absurd. I mean, this was something when I when I ran my first race four years ago, I like talked about it on the doors in a largely like conservative community. Um, and, you know, to, to 
you know, great response from folks. Oh yeah, that, that's absurd. You know, with it, you know, the fact that there's uh, an exemption from all three branches of our state government from being subject to public records law. Um, and we're like the only state in the country that, that uh, maintains that, uh, uh, that factor. So um, needs to be changed. And the only way you're going to change it is by electing people who are going to draw attention to it and are going to fight for the changes because the people who are in power now benefit from the current system. And so it's not to their, their benefit to want to go you know, change rules that are going to put more scrutiny on them. So we as voters need to understand what is happening on our behalf and pay more attention um, and then do our job as educated voters to make the right decisions at the ballot box, um, which is why um, competitive elections are super, super important. And maybe we could talk about that uh, in terms of uh, how difficult it is to run for office in the first place and how, you know, if we were to change uh, the way in which we financed elections, maybe we would have more competitive elections, people would be paying more attention, and then we would have a legislature that actually reflected the sort of lived experiences of this very, very diverse state. Uh, I love that one. Um, we do have a question in the audience here, but uh, before we get to that question, uh, I am going to have you guys talk a little bit about um, competitive elections. I, I, it, I, as I understand it, we have the least competitive state rep elections of any state house in the whole country. That means fewer people challenge. We have fewer challengers running against incumbents of it than any other state, in part because they don't have a voting record. <laughs> I mean, how can you run against people without a voting record? It's pretty hard to run against people. It's like, why are you running against me? Well, because I don't think you're voting against these things. And I'm like, well, I'll just prove it. You know, so a little bit tough. But um, let's let's have a little conversation about that. And Jack, I'm going to have you start um, and talk about um, competitive elections and about public and about financing as well and how, how that ties into it. Sure. So, um, you know, I think one of the fundamental aspects of our democracy is making it so regular people can run for office, which is this really arduous task. I mean, you, you have to uh, get your name out there in the community. Um, and uh, for seats that, elections that people often aren't paying a lot of attention to, which is part of the problem. And I would say that the root of these elections that are not particularly competitive, that people don't pay attention to, that uh, prevent obstacles for people to run for office is all rooted in that challenge. That is that, you know, we, uh, you were required to raise funds to get your name out there so you can run a bunch of advertising as if you're like some sort of capitalist product, but we're not products. We're, we're, we're people who are looking to serve our communities. Um, share the experiences we have of people who live in these communities and be able to deliver on the changes that can improve your community. Um, and so you're, you know, you're running to be able to show contrasted ideas and be able to do that publicly, openly. Um, in a lot of other countries, there's some form of public financing and in a guaranteed amount of airtime to be able to do this in, in a public way. And elections don't take months, they don't take years, uh, in the event of like the presidential cycle, the presidential elections in the United States, um, they take a couple of weeks. And I think that's a much better system because you're gonna have people who are paying more attention because it's, it's like a reflex. People are just in that habit of voting. It's easier for folks to be working people to be able to run for office because they're gonna be guaranteed airtime and a certain amount of uh, funding to be able to get their message out. Um, and by virtue of that, you're going to have elected officials who are more reflective of the communities that they're serving, not just individuals who are particularly privileged, who can take the time to build a run for office um, or have the big networks where they can, um, you know, raise a crap ton of money and bombard you know, people's mailboxes with glossy pieces of mail that, you know, help get their name out. Um, you know, right now I'm, I'm working a couple of shifts in the restaurant that I work at so I can be out there on the doors um, campaigning. And, you know, that's a personal risk I'm willing to take because at a time when the planet is burning and, you know, we need to move on climate, like I can't see anything else I would rather be doing as a young person that is trying 
to talk about these things in a public way. But a lot of workers can't afford to take that time to be honest. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, that is why we have a legislature that does not reflect the diversity of uh, lived experiences in, in this Commonwealth and does not reflect the urgency of the moment that we're in because we have people who have been in there for too long, have gotten out of touch and are not close to the pain that most people are feeling in this state. And, you know, which is why we have, you know, people who don't even participate because at the end of the day, regular people are A, too busy focusing on providing for their base needs. And they say to themselves, what's the point? What, what difference is it gonna make? Because people aren't going to be delivering on things that are gonna make a difference in my life. So why bother? And we have to change that and removing money from the political process and you know, supporting some type of public funding, I think is really the remedy for fixing a lot of what ails us in terms of delivering you know, on the material concerns of, of people in this Commonwealth and taking on some of our biggest challenges, but also for reinvigorating our democracy. Um, and you just gotta find people who are gonna you know, talk about this um, because um, I'm not alone. I'm on a whole slate of candidates who believe the, uh, the same thing. And, um, you know, we could do remarkable things here in Massachusetts only if people paid attention. And we had people who were willing to run and talk about things in an aspirational way. Great. Um, and Kathy, I, I, we were talking earlier and you, you told a story about public financing. And I, I think it's a really important story because first, it's about public financing in elections and what Jack was talking about and how important that is. But second, it shows how the speaker, with all the power that he has, it's always a he, has always been a he, works not to help us move forward, but works to, um, to um, obstruct. So can you tell that story about public financing of elections in Massachusetts? Sure, it was in 1998, and I think there were about 45 reps who were supporting funding for public education and I was not education, public campaigns and political campaigns. And um, so we were working hard at it. And the reason why this came up was because thousands of signatures were collected by volunteers who wanted this to happen in Massachusetts the way it does happen in most of the industrialized countries in the world. So after thousands of hours and finally getting this incredible number of signatures to have public financing and campaigns in Massachusetts, it was put on the ballot and the majority of people pretty much, I'm not sure the numbers, but I'm pretty sure it was pretty overwhelming, wanted public financing of it because they knew they would have more of a voice than the money for campaigns coming from big lobbyists and dark money and all kinds of, of situations and people having watch us so that incumbents always had a foot up on being elected. So, so it won. And then to change the constitution, because this was a constitutional amendment, the legislature can work on the wording and do things to perfect it and make it really work. And um, then it goes back for a second vote of the people. But before that, there, there was a funding question, wasn't there? Oh, yes. So funding, yes. Because of course we need funding. And where was the money going to be coming from? We had um, something put on everybody's tax return that you could do a check mark to donate a dollar to build a, a base for it. But the funding would have cost like one tenth of one percent of the budget. I mean, it was a really low amount of money. But um, the speaker and the legislature could not really come up with a good plan of how it was going to be funded. They said we didn't have the funding for it. I don't know if that was right after the session at that time. But um, they started to sell off some public properties like the state hospital and there were questions about how that happened and to who to whom that went. So um, it 
wasn't used much because government candidates could afford to take that small amount of money and then pledge that they wouldn't take other funding. So the, the um, ballot question came up again two years later. And in between that time, the speaker and the lobbyists were spending millions on TV ads and newspaper ads and even speaking at their um, local events about how bad this was because they were saying, we don't want our public money going to somebody's campaign that we don't want. And, and it was just incredibly bad, the campaign. And the um, information about who funded this fight of the public financing didn't need to be disclosed until five o'clock on the night of that election. So nobody knew where the money was coming from. And uh, it got voted down because a lot of their own reps were telling them how bad it was, as well as the lobbyists. So, so there is still some money that um, mostly state candidates try to access, but it's usually not enough to run against the people who have put the ones. Hopefully we'll do it again. And we need to make it easier and the legislature can also change laws. We don't need to go through the whole constitutional amendment, I don't think, to change political financing. Yeah, I mean, it's just such a story about um, the will of the people versus the power of the speaker. Um, I know there is one question who has, questioner who has been waiting here to say something. Um, and like, if you want to come up here, um, he has something to say about. Do you want to ask a question mm -hmm. or just say a statement? Go ahead. Um, so it's about the speaker. Um, and si uh, I call him Simon Says because if, because if he says something, everybody listens to him. And if he doesn't say something, nobody listens. And if Simon says something, everybody listens. If Simon doesn't say anything, nobody listens. What a perfect way to describe <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're going to be running sometime. I <laughs> hope so. And you'll be a different kind of speaker, I bet. I won't be a That's <laughs> right. Not as I'm a good speaker. Um, do we have other questions? Yes, we have a question from the chat. And this is for Jack. This is a question specifically about infrastructure at Cape Cod. The question would like to know if there are any plans to increase the amount of cars on our road to provide for more alternative forms of transportation in the Cape. Things like bike lanes, buses, sidewalks, maybe a train line one day. <laughs> so, what are your thoughts on that, Jack? I would repeat the question a little bit. For sure. People. So, uh, the question was Is there any plans to increase uh, uh, funding for different types of infrastructure projects here on the Cape to make getting around easier? Um, you know, I, I've seen maps for the uh, Cape Cod metro system. I, I don't think that's in our future, but um, I think. It's, uh, so from the bike lane perspective, um, there is a plan in place uh, to connect the full rail trail from Woods Hole all the way to Provincetown. Right now, there are, you know, every session you get a little bit more funding to help fill those gaps. Um, I think we got to do it as soon as possible to ensure that you can bike from Provincetown to, to Woods Hole um, and make it easier for folks to you know, get around in our communities. Um, I would like to see experimentation with um, you know, ride sharing with publicly owned vehicles. Uh, I was waiting at another table to a European couple a couple weeks ago. Uh, they live in Germany and uh, they love coming to Provincetown A because it's the most bike friendly community in America, which I think is great living here. Um, last summer, I you know didn't have a car and I didn't need one because um, it was so easy to get around. Um, I think having a series of public vehicles um, like a ride share type program uh, for Cape Cod makes sense. If you don't have access to a vehicle, um, life on Cape Cod becomes very, very dis difficult and it's practically impossible for you to be able to even, you know, participate in the community because everything is so disparate. Um, maybe if those 
publicly owned vehicles were uh, electric, that would be great to help reduce some of our carbon footprint. Um, we do have the Cape RTA, which provides good service, but I think increased funding uh, uh, would make it so more people used it. Um, it's tough if you're waiting, you know, half an hour to get on a bus, which is good for a ride that's going to take another hour. Um, it should be easier for folks to get around, and I think we need to, um, you know, come up with strategies that are going to, you know, facilitate uh, getting from A to B uh, more effectively. And I think as someone who is interested in being a legislator, um, you have to approach things from like a political science perspective, which means you look at other places in the world and see how they have implement, implemented systems um, in a, you know, effective manner. And I don't think we do that often enough in the United States uh, in terms of you know, crafting policies um, that are genuinely, you know, trying to, uh, you know, serve the public in the best way possible. I think we go back to that you know, changing of money in our legislative process and um, that, you know, generally produces outcomes that are less than optimal. Um, I believe in a strong, vibrant public sector. And I think that um, when it comes to infrastructure, um, you know, we should be planning our society uh, to make it easy for folks to get around and, you know, live and work with relative ease. So I hope that answers the uh, question. Another question from the chat, right? Yes. <clears throat> Are there any other strategies aside from lifting the ban on rent control so state houses can employ and make housing in the Cape more affordable <clears throat> and prevent the displacement of current renters, which has been a. Yes. So, are there any strategies aside from statewide rent control which can help make housing more affordable here on Cape Cod? Um, yes, and there are pieces of legislation that uh, I wish the incumbent for this particular district was championing because they would make a difference in, in people's lives. Um, number one, I'd like to see a right of first refusal uh, for longtime tenants uh, of a property for when that property comes up to sale. Um, we have this really hot real estate market on the Cape right now where um, a house will go on the market and it's gone within hours, usually for cash buyer who can just, you know, buy the thing outright way above asking price. Um, and it's gotten out of control. So I would like to see the piece of legislation passed. I don't know the exact bill number, but it would provide a right of first refusal for, for longtime tenants of, of uh, a residence uh, so they can you know, purchase that property at the market rate. Um, if you can't come up with, if they cannot come up with that down payment, but they've got a long rental history, I think we should have a public assistance program which gives them that down payment uh, at preferably 0% interest to keep those people in their homes, preferably from a public bank that I think is another piece of legislation that we need to pursue here in the Commonwealth to provide access to credit for people who can't get it. Um, with regard to other strategies for fixing the housing crisis here in the Cape, I think uh, the Airbnb ification of this community has gotten out of control. Uh, we do have a short-term rental tax, that's good. Um, I think we need to have an additional uh, tax on people who have two or more properties because this should not be a business. Housing is a not should not be uh, used as a commodity. If you're a local on Cape who uh, rents out a bedroom or like leaves for the summer to rent out your home so you can continue to afford to live there, you're not the problem. But if you're someone who has a portfolio of properties that you're renting short term, that's taking away from housing stock that would otherwise go to people that want to live and work in this community. And we need to disincentivize that type of economic activity and tax them through the nose and use that money to help construction of community housing, which is my third point. I think a lot of people focus on uh, the 40B program, which I think has largely failed here on Cape Cod. Um, I would like to see the state construct housing in places where uh, we're zoned for it and we can put in some density. Community housing for people that live and work here. We can make it clean, futuristic, environmentally sound. We can really get funky with the design, but uh, I wanna create this image in people's heads that yes, your state government can do this. It's well within our purview to do it. And there's a great need for it. You just need to have people who are out there that are fighting for it. And that is definitely something that uh, uh, I'm going to be out there doing as one who has you know, dealt with housing insecurity myself. Um, 
knows many people in this community who, who uh, have dealt with housing insecurity in recent years, especially now, um, we're at a crisis point on the Cape and you cannot have a community if there's nowhere for people to live. And you know, this uh, at one point in time was uh, a place, talking in the context of Provincetown, was a place where you know, marginalized folks, artists, queer people could come be themselves and uh, make a life for themselves here. Um, and you know, we sort of become this uh, little wealthy enclave uh, where um, only the wealthiest can afford to live here. And um, we have a year on population who works extremely hard to be able to survive here, to maintain that sense of vibrancy that is still here. And we got to build on that and try and support those who want to live here, want to contribute to the community and want to make this place um, their home. Amazing. I, I also can, can feel from you your time spent doing international stuff because um, community housing or social housing is something that we don't do in America. We have public housing, which has a very particular feel because it's completely means tested. So it is only for people who are exceptionally low wage. Um, whereas in Vienna, I believe 60% of the housing in Vienna, 60% of people in Vienna, six zero, not 16, 60% live in community housing or social housing. And what that means is that it is, you know, you, you move in when you are so rich, right? But you stay as long as you want to. It's beautiful, it's functional. It's, you know, it's a place where you're gonna stay for the rest of your life if you can, because you're, you know, your neighbors, it's very, you know, it's not transitory. It's people who wanna live there. It's, you know, it has a lot of great amenities. Um, if it's so, your home, you're going to take care of it. <laughs> it's your home and you're going to take care of it. Exactly, exactly. So it's something, again, that in other countries we see a lot of, and in America, it's a completely foreign concept. I don't know, Kathy, if you have anything to say about that. Um, not so much on the housing, but studies on educational programs in other countries where they really put a lot of money into preschools through grade three because that's when they can identify all the problems and solve them and help the kids to enjoy learning and going to school and really invest in the children big time. And uh, a lot of things we could learn from those countries. And not only investing in children, but investing in mothers, frankly, you know, yeah. in, in allowing, <laughs> that's right. Uh, allowing moms to have a choice of whether they can uh, continue their careers um, and you know grow their careers or whether they really are forced. I mean, some some people want to, and that's great; it's wonderful. Um, but you know, people should have a choice if they want to have a career or if they want to uh, stay home, fathers or mothers. But it tends to be women who uh, you know suffer the most from our complete lack of childcare uh, in America. Do we have more questions from our live audience? Do we do? Excellent. You know what? I'm going to like, would you pass this microphone over to her so that she can talk into the microphone? Thank you. Yeah. You have, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you have a plan for dealing with media to get the message out? In other words, audit and media. Um, I will talk to anyone that is willing to listen. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, create your own space to be able to talk about issues, which is part of the reason why we did this forum tonight, because um, I think that there is enormous public benefit um, about talking about the, the changes that need to take place within our community and within uh, our, our, our state government. Um, as an elected official, um, you have more access to that type of media because you have that, that type of platform and agency that comes with it. And so I would recognize that as a, that, that's why I want the job the most, to be honest with you, you know, because it is a, a public facing role and that role is a wonderful tool to be able to advocate on issues that aren't getting enough attention. So um, 
you know, I think there is, um, you know, multiple components to being a good legislator. And a lot of state reps really just focus on the legislating part, but you're also, there's an advocacy piece to it. And the advocacy piece, I think, is the, the biggest missing element from a lot of members of our legislature. They're so ingrained in the system and are sort of forget that, you know, anytime any big changes have taken place, uh, you know, within a state government or, you know, at the national level, um, it, it comes from outside pressure. And so I'd rather be, you know, actively pursuing an inside and outside strategy as opposed to just like jumping into the vacuum that is Beacon Hill and getting comfortable and um, just uh, working within the system, which quite frankly is not working at all right now. All right, we have another question. Thank you. Let's to this conversation. I'm just appalled at the state we're in. How did Massachusetts, liberal, blue, educated, wealthy Massachusetts, get into the state? And historically, I mean, when did it happen? All the other states, the four states, Alabama, Mississippi, Kentucky. Kentucky, Nebraska, Alabama, and Massachusetts. Oh, sorry, Mississippi. But <laughs> how did Massachusetts get into such terrible situation? In my mind, is it, you know, blow it up and start over? Which is probably not the best thing to stay in. It's just overwhelming for me. And I admire Jack so much for putting himself out there to do this. Uh, I would just going to give a tiny bit of history, which is that in 1973, there were uh, nine paid chairs and co-chairs before 1973. And then it was raised up to 12, I think. I might be getting this slightly wrong. I don't know the exact dates. And then in the 90s, it was raised to 55 or maybe, maybe late 80s. And then um, in 2017, it was raised to 83 paid chairs and co-chairs. That is more than the number of reps needed to pass any bill. So these are the number of paid positions that the speaker decides and the speaker chooses based upon who is willing to vote the way he tells them to vote. And then in 2021, it was increased to 93. So, so when you're asking historically, like how do these things happen? Like that is how that one particular thing Happened. It's not the transparency piece, it's more the sort of control, financial control, financial incentives that the speaker has to enforce um, people vote the way he tells them to vote. Um, but that's how that one happened. And Kathy, I'm going to pass the rest to you to talk about, like, how did we get here? Well, I just learned from you how much it's grown since I was there. I had no idea. About that, but that is sad to think 93 out of 160 are paid. What an incentive to, um, speaker, but it's so much too about being elected instead of serving the people doing common good. I was just going to jump in and say that, um, State Rep Denise Provost, after the 2017 vote to make it 83, she said, There will never again be dissent in the House. So sad. And um, when we see the inaction that happens federally and locally, it's, I mean, things like immigration, things like clean air, clean water, and the environment. These are life and death situations. And we're, um, when I visited Cuba to see how people are living there and that the um, money we spend on healthcare like doubles or triples what they spend and the life expectancy there is only two years behind us. And what could be happening in this country to prevent our health issues instead of helping the pharmaceutical companies make more money. So we need to get a lot more dissent in our own legislature. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. I don't know that we know exactly how it got that way, but like 
once once a certain amount of power happens, I think they they're able to sort of leverage that power to get more and more and more and more. Uh, the old adage, thank you, power corrupts. The old adage, power corrupts. Wow, we are and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. <laughs> Indeed. So we are nearing the end of our time together. I am so thrilled about everyone who is here in the audience, folks who are still tuned in. It's been a long discussion, but really an intriguing one. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and let Kathy have a last statement, and then we're going to go to you, Jack, and have you um, say wrap us up. Okay? So Kathy, you first. Well, I see this as being an extremely important date which is September 6th, primary date in Massachusetts. And Jack's election will be decided on that day. And we saw what happened in January 6th in this country, which was one of the saddest days in our country. And I feel in my heart that we're in a sad, sad situation. And that Jack is willing to move forward and change that situation. Thank you, Jack. And everybody get out and vote. Pay attention and vote. Thank you, wonderful, wonderful. Jack, wrap us up here. Bring us home. Sure, sure. Um, we could do a lot here in, in Massachusetts. Um, we could do a hell of a lot, but people need to know uh, what is possible here. Um, if we just paid attention more. Um, so I have uh, an enormous uh, challenge on my hand, uh, you know, taking on someone who uh, has been in the system for a very long time. Um, we need help. So whether folks can, you know, sign up with our campaigns, knock on doors um, to make a contribution so we can help get our message out, um, to, spread the word in their communities about the importance of this election. Um, this is arguably the most important election uh, folks in this community will have over the next year. Um, and so we decided in September 6th. Um, and so we encourage people to, to really, you know, make this part of your day-to-day -day conversation uh, as you go about your day, because, um, you know, this is extremely consequential. State politics are extremely consequential and you know, we need to be talking about these things uh, as a habit, uh, as, as everyday citizens, more so than we do now. And uh, I'll just leave with one final thought. Um, we're in the middle of the heat wave right now in, in North America. Uh, a lot of Europe is uh, under the same set of circumstances, uh, much worse. Um, we're out of time when it comes to the climate crisis and the world that I'm going to be inheriting um, is going to be a lot different than the one that I grew up in, and, and not in good ways. Um, we've spent our carbon budget, uh, and we have a very limited amount of time now to reduce the amount of damage. We're not going to get the same world that you know I grew up in, Kathy grew up in, and I grew up in. It's gone, but there's a lot we can save and. Um, Growing up, uh, I spent a lot of time on Barnstable Harbor, it was my like, place of solace. Um, there's an underpass on Route 6A um, that has a mural uh, under the, the train bridge, and it's um, a fisherman throwing a net out uh, onto the ocean, and uh, it's inscribed, it says, preserve what's left. And um, I think um, in the context of the climate crisis, which should be our you know, sole organizing principle as a society globally, um, right now, um, you know, we can make a world that is a lot more just and equitable in the process. And I think that we need to begin here in Massachusetts. And uh, uh, hope that we can take this out to the streets, win this election, and ensure that we can ensure that we have a better commonwealth for those of us alive now and the years to come. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thank you, Jack. Okay.